it was just all a bit of a yeah, it was a good buzz, you know. If I wasn't there, I, was, I felt like I was missing out on something. My uncle got a table for his son, yeah. and I went over his house. And I started playing that, and I thought it was good. I couldn't knit a ball to save my life, but... And then my dad got me a table at Christmas, and I weren't allowed to play on it until Christmas. And we had it in for two weeks, and he kept saying, no, no, you're not playing on it. <laughs> and I used to cry, and he used to play all his mates. My dad kind of invested a lot of time and money, if you like, into supporting me, making sure that I could get to tournaments, making sure that I'd get taxis to the snooker club, make sure my table bill was always paid, my food bill was always paid. All he asked was for me to not mess around and, and when I was there to, to put the effort in and, and not play the fruit machines, because I went for a spell of playing fruit machines. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I was like 200 pound jackpot. I was only like nine. I thought I'd have some of that. My dad, my dad used to come here and think, God, that's a big bill, 70 quid. He used to wonder what I was spending my money on. He said, and then one day he come in and my dad put a couple of quid in the fruit machine. He said, now I just see this little head pop up. He said, and you were looking under the wheels. He said, and then I realised where all the money was going. What kind of things would you get up to in the club then? You wasn't allowed to bring your own food into the club, and, and I, but I just wasn't going to eat their burger and chips and their fried food. I was on a health kick, so I'd bring in my own food, my own sandwiches. And she'd go, you're not allowed to bring your food in. i go, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, but you got a spoon for me yoghurt and that. And she'd be fuming. You could see there was smoke coming out of her ear holes. But you know, it was just little things, you know. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of banter with the other lads, you know. Um, you just, it was just good fun. How do you feel when you watch Snooker on the television, you see the Steve Davises and everybody else? Is that where you're headed? Yeah. Yeah. How big do you want to be? Five ten. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He obviously meant how big did I want to be in the sport, but I said I want to be about five foot ten. <laughs> and I just remember everyone laughing. I thought, what are they laughing at? But then, like, obviously, when I watched it back, I was like, oh, OK. I know why they're laughing now. But that's all I wanted to be was five foot ten. I thought that was the perfect height for a snooker player. No good being four foot nine. I never made it. In a way, I bullied people on the table without really knowing it. Um, but I just, I just knew that if there was a red on, I was going to clear up. Really set my mind to it. Really concentrated, and I really slowed my game down because he's a very fast player and just tried to do his brain in as much as I couldn't and I didn't and he started missing balls and I got him and then I won the game 3-1. The obvious question is, what do you make of Ronnie O'Sullivan? Only 14 six weeks ago. That's right, a great player and um, I've played him in a couple of exhibition matches and um, proved today that he can do it in front of the cameras and uh, I don't really think that even Stephen Hendry was was putting the no sort of breaks on the television at 14. But I kind of learnt off of Steve Davis, if you like, when I was a youngster. That was who I wanted. He was my role model. So I used to copy everything he used to do. I used to watch all his videos, all his games. I'd watch how he'd walk around the table, his cue action, everything. I mean, I, I copied him to his waistcoat, his shoes, everything. You know, there wasn't anything I missed out, you know, because he was my role model. So would you watch Steve on TV and sort of make mental notes about what to, how to dress and how to play? Well, a lot of it was visualisation, really. You kind of visualised how he got down to the shot, where his body was, where he was on the table, where his arm was, how his arm was bent, where his head was situated, where his shoulders were. I'd studied the whole lot, how his leg was bent, this one, this one was straight, um, you know, the levels of his hips. I studied him like you wouldn't believe. Bang on that left eye, I like it. I suppose it was obsessive if you look at it now, because it's. But I think you need to be. For me to have got to that level, if I wouldn't have been thinking like that, then I could have just been, you know, an average player. But I didn't want to be. I didn't realise I was what I wanted to be. I just knew that if I was going to do it, that he was the man to follow, and and I had to follow every little detail to the to the last, and and every little detail mattered. He loves his kids. I remember him looking around and going, wow, what is that? I wanted to win more world titles and got the flavour. Success was lovely. Don't ever doubt me. Don't ever tell me that I'm gone. I will let you know when I'm gone.
personally the champion and being made up and privileged to be the first player. Ronnie's just a genius really, easily the best player that's ever played. Um, he sort of plays like, sort of like he don't want to be there but you know that he's trying his life out there. He gives off this aura when you play him. Um, he puts you under more pressure than anyone else, so he's always tough playing him. I'm a good friend of his. He's a smashing kid. Um, well, he's a man now, but uh, he's always been a smashing kid and got a heart of gold. And uh, I just hope he can get up when he plays snooker and enjoy it because everybody enjoys watching him. What, me, Jimmy, and Ronnie? We're in an unbelievable situation to watch Ronnie Wood and Keith Richards playing the guitars. It was a nice hot day, I remember it. So he was having a few drinks. We was sort of having a few drinks with him, and then they sort of told us, you know, you have a game of snooker. And then Ronnie said, come, we've got to play snooker. So I was like, all right. So we went and played. And we'd been up all night, and... Um, if I remember it, right, it was like out of 11 frames, it was 10 centuries. So that was an amazing bit of snooker. He beat me 6-5, I remember it. I do remember it, I've got quite a good memory. I thought that was a great night as well, wasn't it? Can't remember it. He can. And I remember can to Keith. I was, I was just drinking vodka and orange. So I was like a little bit, that's probably why I was parting all the balls. And uh, he kept going to get me my drink. And then halfway through it, he went to like Mozart. And I remember watching Mozart when I was at school and he was like this genius pianist. So to, for Keith to say that, I was like, oh, he must be impressed by this, you know? Certainly thrilling this crowd is Ronnie O'Sullivan. Obviously a name for the future. And I'm sure you're very excited at home as well as we are here. Ronnie O'Sullivan, 22, frame on the match. Quite simply magnificent. He takes the Embassy World Championship as a crucible audience, give him a standing ovation. I wanted to get better. I wanted to win more world titles, win more UKs. I've got the flavour now. Success was what it, it was lovely. Ronnie O'Sullivan becomes the 2008 world champion. I felt good. I felt happy, and I was like, okay. So I just kept going and kept going and kept going. And then I had spells where my game would fall off. But you know, I had something. To, I had someone to work with and things in place to make me help me keep on track. How Ronnie's cope with it and how his dad's cope with it has been remarkable really that they've come through this really long difficult 18 years or so period and now of course they're back and bonded again and, and they're best mates as well as being father and son. Sum up your dad then, what kind of guy is he? How would you describe him? Uh, heart of gold, loyal um, and, uh, and hungry. <laughs> I'm not hungry, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more laid back. I'm a bit more, oh yeah, we'll see what happens, go with the flow. On the snooker table, I'm hungry, you know, I'm ferocious. But away from it, I just can't be bothered. I just let things go. I go, oh, don't worry about it. You know, if someone's done something wrong to me, I go, that's all right, I don't care, you know what I mean? I sometimes feel I'm too laid back to let too, too many things go. And, and really, I should have a bit more of a, you know, go get type of attitude, you know? Because I admire that in people. All my friends have got that. They get up and go, and they do, 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 like, and I just, you know, I just buzz off of them. But I can't be bothered. I'd rather go run and have a boiled egg in the morning, read me paper, and just chill out. Go to walk over the forest, get me mountain bike out, put the two kids in the back, fresh air, cup of tea and a muffin, weigh them in, get them tired, bring them home, put them in bed. I'm done. realize until the first one comes you like changes your whole you know there's a reason to go to work now as before I was like you could just go along with the flow if you like but then when someone else comes into the world you're like hold on I'm, I'm now responsible for this little thing here that don't know how to eat you just poos in a nappy and when you go out the door you go to work you go right I've got to go and do it for them now this young lad is making the game look incredibly simple at the moment can. 
fact that some shots I can't play, which I used to be able to play when I was 12, 13, 14, which separated me from the rest. Now and again they come into my game and it falls into place and then I'm, I'm away and I can't be caught. You know, they can't stay with me. Like this year's World Championships, I spelled I went bam, 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 bang, and there was nothing that anybody could have done. Final three of World Championships. The crowd are going wild. Yeah. I could put that ball anywhere on the table. I could ta I could I could dominate. I could attack. I could out safety him. I could out put him. There was nowhere that they could go with me for certain times in that World Championships. The crowd now realise that it's all over. The win this year was a statement of what Ronnie O'Sullivan can bring to the game of snooker. And it's that entertainment, it's that wow factor, the X factor. It's going to be emotional here in the Crucible Theatre. What a performance from Ronnie O'Sullivan. Three times a world champion. It's now four. Your champion, Ronnie O'Sullivan. For little Ronnie to come to the World Championships, that was the best buzz. And to have him there for the final day, for me, was just like the best thing, at, you know, great feeling. And I never get emotional. I always hold back my emotions. I never break down. I try not to anyway. My dad said to me, don't ever cry if you win. <laughs> I was like, all right. Okay. Still running, yeah. That's even better, that, because look, he's buzzing with the, uh, look, he's looking at all the little things that come up on the, you know, when they go bang and all them little things. I didn't realise, because obviously, but he was more buzzing with all that. I remember him looking around and going, wow, what is that? That there, he's just, he's just posing, isn't he? Best moment ever for me, that. It just felt like me and him were in that venue at that time. There was a thousand people in there, because it's only a small venue. But it just, it just felt like it was just me and him there. I was going through, putting him last balls, and I just oh, I was like, come on, hold it down. I like, hold it down, but it was just like a mental feeling. Mental feeling, because you know, I've been through a lot the last few years. And my bond with him is so strong in a way that it kind of like, it really, f it was only me and him there. And he said to me the other day, he says, we won the world title, didn't we? And I was like, yeah, we did. He loves his kids, and it was a wonderful situation for him to get his fourth title. You know, him and Higgins are the two best players in the world, and uh, he's levelled him on the world title, so, you know, and he's back playing. You can't gamble on this Ronnie O'Sullivan and know what the Ronnie O'Sullivan in three months is going to be like, because his life has always been controversial and always been surprising and never ever predictable. For me that's like the final chapter. Yeah. There ain't no more chapters to be written anymore. Done it all. I've seen it through. I've done what I've had to do. I've made my kids proud. I've done whatever I've had to do and I will continue to do that as a father. But as far as me having to prove myself on the table as far as me having to win another tournament it doesn't matter anymore because you hear people talk and they say this and they say that and I had to listen to it and I thought you know what I'll wipe the floor with you but you're out there doubting me and you're out there thinking you could beat me so I had to just do that and go yeah that's what I've you know done you know I'm still the the, the best player in the world and that's what I said to him afterwards, I said, don't ever doubt me, don't ever tell me that I'm gone, I will let you know when I'm gone. And now ain't the time, and it ain't for the next three or four years if I wanted it. But maybe I'm going to choose not to, who knows. But I don't have to prove myself anymore. That was a good one. I will say when it's over, is when it's over. But don't, they don't have to doubt me. Because the more they doubt me, the more it'll just make me want to come back and prove them wrong again. And I don't want to have to go through it again, I've done it. Chapter's over. Tomorrow night at 9, Jeremy Wade is tracking a fish known as the ball cutter.